Um, so there's going to be 20 minutes of initial talk. Each session is basically going to be 40 minutes. It's 20 minutes of talking. Uh, that's uh, then for the second 20 minutes, it's going to, we're going to try to focus on the, the three most important takeaways and uh, that, that you had in the 20 minutes. You know, we're going to 20 minutes of those. And then at the end of that 40 minutes, we're going to report back and everybody, every group is going to report on one of those takeaways. Christopher will walk us through all this. Don't worry, you don't need to learn much. This will all be handled by facilitators. But please, if you're interested in either being a facilitator or, or, or a scribe or a topic table, um, you know, volunteer to do that. Um, a scribe, by the way, doesn't have to write everything down. Um, we're basically trying to get the, the main points. Speaking of scribes and facilitators, we have Sita Mag. She is our graphic facilitator. Thank you to Block Street for providing this. And uh, Sita uh, was really picked, and she's going to visually capture the key ideas that happen here in the plenary. So there's going to be a plenary stuff where everybody's involved. There's going to be the breakout stuff. She's going to capture stuff for the plenary. Um, so, uh, media, privacy, et cetera. We are going to have some video recordings. Um, but, so if you don't want to be on video, respectfully, uh, don't get into the video camera. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, then avoid being recorded. Um, <laughs> it, it will be pointed at the podium. It will be, it'll be pointed. I'm looking at you right now. Um, and uh, this is the only place that's going to be recorded video-wise. Um, if you're interested in doing little uh, DASA, sometimes that's little interviews. If you're interested in being on a little video thing, come talk to DASA. Uh, and uh, speaking of interviews, Bailey, are you here? Uh, Bailey Reutzel is going to be here. Um, she is a reporter. She's done stuff for, uh, is it Coinbase? No. Yeah, she's done, she's done things, she's a freelance, uh, Coindesk, thank you, Coindesk, uh, she's probably going to be doing a couple of interviews, if you're interested in being interviewed, uh, you can talk to her, she, otherwise she'll talk to her, she has, she has made sure that she uh, will not quote anybody uh, unless they uh, give her permission to be quoted, um, and speaking of quoting people, social media, uh, the hashtag for this event is blockchain web. Um, please do not quote people out of context. This gets you in trouble and gets other people in trouble and it's embarrassing. Let people uh, know that you plan on tweeting about them if they said something that's not here. If they're here, they're here, I feel it's fair game. Say something. Please ask them before you tweet it. Follow the golden rule. Tweet others as you would want to be tweeted yourself. Um, so uh, just be careful that the things in here don't spread uh, out of context elsewhere. Uh, this is obviously a public thing and it's meant to be public, but we don't want people to have to defend themselves of something that they said in this room uh, in the larger media stage. Um, okay, uh, why we're here is an opportunity for collaboration. WPC wants to know if there's anything that is ready for standardization, if we have a role for that. Um, is there any way in which the blockchain can help the web and web standards, or vice versa, is there anything that web standards can do for blockchain? That's, That's what we're interested in. There may be other things that come out of this, other collaborations that you have that have nothing to do with standards. That's great. We're glad you're here. Um, um, somebody somebody asked me to talk a little bit about uh, standardization uh, value. Like, what is the, how do you go about standardizing things? I'm not going to talk about the process. We need to talk a little bit more about but, um, and by WTC in general, when is something ready for standardization? Is there a clear problem statement that this would solve for a significant number of people? That's maybe an indicator that there's a value in standardization. Um, is there a new starting point? Is there already an implementation? Is there a spec? Is there a clear solution? Um, or are there a set of main solutions? Those are all, that's also good candidates for standardization. And do we and have the right stakeholders? In other words, are the, are the right people ready to come to the table at that time? And are they ready to implement things, test things, um, write review, etc.? Are they ready to deploy this thing? 
If none of those things, things are true, it's probably not ready for standards. If, any, if all of those things are true, I might be ready for standards. Um, WCC focuses specifically on three main things. Uh, we focus on the client side features, browser, base, markup languages, JavaScript APIs, user facing features. Um, this is our main focus. This is what most of our stuff is. We also do stuff around data formats, like interchange formats, ontologies, vocabularies, uh, languages to manipulate data, etc. Just, just as a caveat, a lot of the browser vendors steer very far clear of these things. So if you want to get involved in those, it's a good idea to talk with browser vendors first to make sure that they uh, that this is something they're interested in. If it's something that's going to touch with touch on browser client side stuff at all, probably it's probably a good idea to get browser vendors involved earlier rather than later. Um, but it has to touch the browser. Uh, we also do communication protocols. We do those more rarely, uh, usually only when there's a client side API. Uh, for example, WebRTC, uh, there's, there's client side APIs and there's stuff that there's, there's protocols. And usually we partner with the IETF to do stuff like that. So there's lots of WPC staff here. Uh, will all the WPC staff stand up? Um, so I see Jeff Jackie back there. Uh, Jeff is our CEO. I see Alan Berg. Alan is a biz dev guy. If you want to join WPC or give us lots of money, Alan's a guy to talk about. Uh, Son is a uh, guy working on Solid and some SimWeb stuff. Uh, formats. formats. Uh, and Wendy Seltzer is the head of technology and standards domain. Uh, I'm Doug Shepherds, uh, Jack of all trades, master. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And uh, so, I want to so thank our sponsors, uh, Daza uh, uh, and Neha. Uh, here at Media Labs, Labs. Professor, Professor Sandy Temple is providing space. space. Um, um, NTT. NTT, do we have NTT, NTT here? Ah, uh, NTT. NTT is over here. They're going to be doing a demo over at this table. Uh, I invite you all to uh, go to the demo and talk, talk to them. They can do it in for us. Thank you very much for the sponsorship. They're making, all, of our all of our sponsors are making this possible. Blockstream, Blockstream uh, a graphical uh, facilitator. Generous uh, agency members have provided funds for this. Um, meals. We have twice the number of planned attendees. We've got meals for everybody. Thank you again to the sponsors. Can everybody get the sponsors at hand? We'll provide them. Try to meals for everybody. If you did if you not, not uh, uh, register, register in time, time, you might not get a meal. If you don't have a badge with your name printed on it, respectfully, respectfully um, ask, ask people, make sure, make sure that people who have, have uh, who uh, uh, put in the effort to get uh, involved early on, uh, make, sure uh, make sure that they have their meals. There's vegetarian, there's vegetarian vegan, vegan gluten free meals. meals. Please do not take food that, that you, didn't, you didn't ask for. <laughs> Vegetarian, vegetarian everybody, everybody eats vegetarian, vegetarian food, um, so take don't take one of the vegetarian boxes, boxes unless, uh, unless it's, it's clear, clear that all the vegetarians have already gotten their food. Um, I'm a vegetarian, and I, I will eat humans if it comes down to it, so don't, don't, don't push, push me. me. Uh, if, you had if you had a request for a meal, come to me. At, at the, if, you, if, you, if we're not able to feed you, I apologize. There are, there are food trucks right around, right around the corner there. there. Um, really good food. That's what I only eat food trucks here. Um, and and uh, uh, we, there we, we, probably, we probably have food for everybody, but I just want to make sure that the people, the people who uh, had food first. Um, uh, another, uh, another thing, apparently, apparently there was some food over there in that area. Please do not, please do not take the food that's out there. All our people will be in here. Um, it's it's uh, 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 that is for uh, a set of other people. They only take food that's in your space. And and all your, all your trash. There are three bins back there. There's trash, trash recycling, recycling, and compost. Please please um, bust your own bust your own tables. Uh, if you make trash, put it back there. Thank you. Um, that's it. That's it. Uh, uh, thank you for attending. Treat everybody, treat everybody right. respectfully. Have fun, uh, have fun or, or don't, whatever, whatever you, prefer. you prefer. If you have, if you have any problems, you're here, here or outside, or outside uh, if there's any issues, contact me, contact me this is my phone number. Um, and uh, any, any, any troubles that you're having, let me know. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, and it is a moment to get her slide set up. Um, and thanks, everybody. Any questions, comments? Hashtag is blockchain web. One word. How about blockchain on the WPC panel? On the WPC panel? I actually got WPC.org. Hashtag blockchain. Hashtag hash blockchain. Blockchain. <laughs> getting set up, I might uh, invite people to join the irc.w3.org. Proceedings. Fantastic. Fantastic. So thank you all for joining us here. Um, um, it's really, it great, really to, great to, uh, uh, to see you today. Uh, to join us in thinking through uh, what blockchain uh, the technologies and the uh, industry interests and uh, the, the, the technological development mean for us here at W3C and our work in standards. Um, so, why do you come to W3C? Uh, our uh, founder and uh, director have said it best when he tweeted out of the London Olympics this is for everyone. Uh, we, uh, we are working, working to build the web, web into uh, an open platform that is available, available accessible, locally, uh, uh, interoperable, and uh, usable, usable by everyone. everyone. And, and so, so uh, if you have technology that you want to work on that global open basis um, in a distributed manner, uh, then uh, the web is the platform on which to do that. Uh, and W3C is uh, the consortium and standards body uh, that works to uh, help keep the web uh, open and help to build uh, the consensus on uh, on which the web is founded. We don't have uh, police power to compel people to obey web standards. Uh, what we do is to build consensus through uh, W3C process uh, and with our open royalty-free patent policy uh, to invite people to, to work together. And, and, and so we have uh, more than 400 members of organizations, thousands, thousands of participants to, to working groups, to community groups, uh, to interest groups, to work, to work together. Um, we have a relatively, relatively small staff to work with all of those people, about 65 uh, members of the, the technical uh, and administrative staff, working, working to facilitate uh, that consensus. Uh, we work in uh, working groups. Um, are the, the groups that develop the, the recommendation uh, track standards. Uh, we also have interest groups and community groups that work at uh, the earlier stages of development, use cases, use cases requirements, and requirements, generating, generating ideas, helping to incubate the, uh, the standards standard process. process. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned we're governed by uh, process, process documents, documents our, that our constitution, constitution uh, sets out the ways that we work and bring people together. And we, we, rarely, we rarely take votes and uh, we much, much more often are uh, engaging, engaging large groups, large groups and, and, uh, in, uh, in debate and discussion and to figure, and to figure out, out what, what can we live with, what, what can we all live with uh, that will enable us to work together. together. Uh, um, so uh, here's a... Uh, here's a 
uh, 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 rough and barely readable diagram on each of our, our, our uh, standards uh, development process. process. Um, um, we start from the bottom. bottom. Uh, we, are uh, the, we are in the very early phases of thinking about blockchain and thinking about the technologies that work together. We start in our in our investigation of technologies, often with workshops and community groups, to brainstorming, thinking about. What does the web need? What does the technology need? Where are places that our public and our membership can work together with the help of our technical staff uh, that we can help facilitate uh, working uh, together? And possibly uh, out of that comes the formation of a working group. Uh, possibly, uh, possibly uh, out of that, uh, out of that comes uh, uh, great conversations, conversations that start up around tables here and go off and form technology startups or go off and form academic research projects or go off and uh, incubate in, uh, in industry or uh, in uh, public interest organizations. One possible development there, uh, though, after uh, that incubation uh, happens, uh, happens after people, people say, you know what we really, we really need to work together, together um, is uh, a common interface, a common API, uh, a common format. Um, um, when, when, we when we have that level, level of, of uh, clarity, clarity um, we, um, might we might form a working group, working, working group that iterates, iterates on uh, uh, the proposed standard. standard uh, sends it out, uh, sends for, it out for public comment, comment invites uh, uh, comment, comment from its participants, uh, moves up the, the recommendation track, um, and uh, after, uh, after uh, consensus, consensus is reached in the working, working group and, and uh, among the, the wide uh, review, uh, review from, from the public, uh, that, uh, that might be uh, published, published as, as uh, an uh, recommendation. 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 Yeah. And, and that's saying, not saying, uh, uh, again, again, that we know, that we know what any particular recommendation might come, might come out of here, but um, um, if we, uh, if we uh, find, if we find something, that's where we, it will go. So what are we thinking of more particularly uh, here with the blockchain in the lab? Uh, there are two different ways the blockchain and web standards can work together. Can work together. Uh, we can think about what does the web need to add, uh, to add in order to support, support blockchain, blockchain uh, better. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's uh, uh, possibilities like uh, crypto, uh, formats, APIs uh, that could be added to the web to make it easier to uh, access the distributed ledger uh, universally any place you have a web browser. Um, easier for the web to interface with uh, those distributed ledgers. Um, and, and, then, and then, conversely, conversely uh, there are also opportunities in for how can the, tech the technologies of blockchain support, support the web. The web. Uh, uh, so, so, for example, uh, distributed ledgers, ledgers supporting uh, certificate, certificate transparency uh, is an effort that's underway at the IETF, um, storing the, the record of uh, certificate issuance on uh, on uh, a ledger publicly transparently so that, so that uh, uh, anyone, anyone can check for certain business issues. And so, so uh, as I mentioned, mentioned um, some, some things, things are right for standards, standards. Uh, uh, some, some things, things are uh, truly or not yet, yet uh, standards, standards ready. ready. Standards are great for improvement, uh, harmonization, and consensus. When there are already multiple examples of the way something might be done, uh, and we need to smooth the corners or fit uh, two or three or four of them together uh, on the same framework. Uh, when there are already uh, working examples from which to derive a consensus patterns uh, to match, to bring uh, to uh, standard repertoire. Um, standards are less well suited uh, at the beginning of the innovation process. Uh, there's lots of new ideas going on. We don't want to walk anything into uh, a standard. We're not yet ready to say. You know, yes, yes, this must be the, the block size, or this must be uh, the format in which uh, things are expressed. Uh, While well, innovation is running, um, 
that's the great thing when it comes to incubating possible standards and identifying places where, where uh, you, might uh, you might need, need more coordination. coordination. Um, not yet the time to, to write it into uh, uh, this, this is, is a global, global recommendation, recommendation for the web. Uh, so, so I, I wanted, wanted to briefly mention, mention uh, some of the, the work the W3C is already doing that might be relevant to, uh, to work that, uh, that, that you're looking at. Um, so we, in, in the security and privacy area, uh, we have work in web, web, web authentication, uh, uh, fair share of that uh, group here. Uh, we, we have, have work in web crypto, uh, we, we have web application security, payments, uh, we have privacy interest group. Uh, okay. and both the interest group and the working group. Um, and then um, in the broader web, uh, we have HTML being worked on the web platform working group. Uh, there's work on web performance, uh, CSS, uh, HTML media, WebRTC, real-time communications. Uh, there's graphics, there's audio, there's fonts, there um, all sorts of uh, pieces I wanted to uh, dive into a couple of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, web authentication is one of, is one of the uh, newest uh, pieces, pieces of work that, that uh, came, came over to, to W3C from uh, Fido Alliance. Uh, right. uh, username, uh, and username and password is a terrible way to authenticate. If we do it everywhere on the web, uh, how can we get beyond that and make uh, strong crypto the basis of uh, all of our uh, web authentication? Uh, so uh, the web authentication working group is uh, is building the web APIs to uh, act as the interface between the local authenticator, um, the, the web client, and uh, the, the, the relying party, uh, specifically where that big arrow is between the, uh, the local client, which might be a web browser on a mobile device, a web browser on a, uh, a laptop. Um, and, and uh, uh, the website online party. Uh, so so uh, this will be one module of uh, a larger uh, auth authorization framework. We're building uh, a way to do strong authentication uh, from, from the web client. Um, another uh, piece of, of work uh, that is in its candidate recommendation phase um, is the web crypto API. Uh, so instead of inviting every web developer to write his own uh, or her own uh, JavaScript crypto libraries, uh, we're building uh, an API uh, standard across the browsers. When uh, implementers are building uh, the implementation, we are standardizing what that API looks like uh, so that a call to encrypt or decrypt or uh, verify uh, produces uh, a result uh, cross browser. Uh, so this is a place where if there are specific crypto functions, specific algorithms that uh, that you need for blockchain operations uh, an update to the work of the web crypto working group uh, could uh, be a good interface for that. The moment we have a set of standard curves and algorithms um, and those are being tested for interoperability and uh, moved forward toward uh, recommendation. Uh, but the, uh, the API is extensible. And uh, if there are additional uh, algorithms uh, needed, uh, this is a good place uh, to build uh, for those. Uh, lots of work in our web application security working group. Um, if you're building uh, web applications and want to assure that uh, others aren't uh, injecting in cross-site scripting attacks and uh, data theft um, attacks, the various APIs um, designed in, in web app set help to secure a uh, web application, uh, make it easier for uh, the authors of web apps to deploy securely and uh, rely on the, on the transform layer security uh, of HTTPS. Um, yeah, places to think about if you're developing uh, applications in the browser, uh, looking into web app set uh, APIs and designs. Uh, and support for uh, encryption everywhere because we, um, we believe that uh, a strong web is one where 
uh, people can rely on end-to-end -end security and uh, authentication and integrity protection. Uh, and so we support uh, HTTPS with, uh, uh, with browser side features. And we have web payments work. Uh, we're building up a, uh, a payment request API. Um, and uh, that's looking uh, across payment types. Um, and so if you're here because you're interested in Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, look into the web payments work to think about uh, whether uh, uh, that, that is extensible in the, in the ways that, that you would need to, to support uh, alternative currencies, whether it, uh, uh, it, it uh, uh, by, by default, default uh, or, the, the, the protocol, protocol will, will support, will support you know, payment. payment. And, uh, and does it, does it uh, include the, the payments features or is it extensible to include the payment features that, uh, that, that you might need for uh, the cryptocurrency. Um, and uh, along with the basic payment request API, there are uh, payment method identifiers, uh, basic card payment, payment and progress on uh, payment applications uh, to, to, to support uh, that idea. Um, so uh, I'll put this up on the web with links to the various pieces of uh, existing W3C work. Um, and uh, we invite you to think about that as one template for the way standards work uh, can happen, uh, one interface for uh, kinds of uh, work that you might be doing. Uh, but most of all, uh, I want to invite you to, to sh share ideas uh, and thoughts about uh, work that may be well pre-standards phase right now. Uh, think about W3C as uh, a big tent in which you can have conversations uh, about that, that work and uh, come back to our recommendation track down the road when you have something, something that looks standards, uh, standards ready. ready. Uh, so thanks very much and thank you again for uh, coming to share your ideas at this workshop. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Brown, and I'm going to be handling the next session, uh, which is about collaboration. But first, I'd like to do a little housekeeping. So we're going to be distributing some stuff on the table. But the other thing we need to do is distribute some people. So I'd like everybody to stand, give yourself a stretch, a wiggle. Um, look at your table. If you've got seven people at your table, I need one of you to move to another table. There are six people per table. Well, I have my rock count right now. There are some tables over here that only have three people. There's some space over here. If you've got space over here, uh, we, uh, we, So there's some space there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, You've done, You've done with your wiggle, wiggle and you've got enough people at your table. And ideally, every table should have five, you know, four or five people, not three. Okay. So that's, that's the other, the other side. side of if you're at a table, table with six people, people and you see a table next to you, it's only about four, you may want to consider moving the over the table four. It'll give you more time to see. Okay. So, so I see, I see a, a table here, here with four people. people. I see a table here of three. three. You can move over here. Okay, so okay, we have table of four. So, so 20 minutes divided by four. If you more time, you have four minutes in that time. Okay. okay, so, so um, the, goal the goal of this, of this session, session is to share stories uh, and, and lessons, lessons around, around collaboration. So the cards that I'm handing out right now um, were, were is a distillation of over a century of facilitation work. These, uh, you know, over 50 facilitators got together and uh, looked at what were the patterns in common for the best events, the best collaborations that they were involved in, uh, and distilled them down into 91 patterns of what makes for a great, wonderful, magical, 
collaboration. So uh, everybody's going to get um, uh, one of these collaborations. Uh, you can either, uh, once the, all of them are packed out, you can either grab, you know, grab one randomly, um, or you can pick one of the set. And my suggestion is that you, when you're done reading it, put it in your um, in, in your uh, uh, bag, behind your bag. So I would like you to be the avatar for that particular pattern for the rest of the two days. I'd like you to think about what it is that is this particular um, uh, pattern of greatness and see if you can't uh, embody it or recommend it or find it um, in the next two days. Um, so for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, I would like each of you to tell a story about a collaboration that has that was really meaningful to you. Um, you know, it can be a business collaboration, a standards effort that you worked on. It can be another team in your company, um, or it can even just be a, a, a personal collaboration that you just found really, really powerful. Well, I'd like you to share about three minutes of a, a story about a collaboration that you found very, very powerful. So uh, the time is now uh, 9.23. So uh, let's try to do this in around uh, about 15 minutes. So uh, the five person table, that's three minutes each. Uh, that's next round. These are not for now, though. I think it's for now. Oh, yes. So I, I think the exercise is we look at the cards and that we talk, we share, share with story. each other when we successfully collaborated with other organizations. I think. Yes. Okay. The story doesn't have to focus on the card, but it is more. Think of yourself with that avatar yeah. for the next two days. Any thoughts? On any collaboration. What kind of operation? Do you mean thoughts on successful previous collaboration? Yeah. yeah just you want to share it? Is that is that the objective? Yep. I would is. say so. My uh, my most recent successful collaboration is our blockchain startup inside of Microsoft, where basically cool. everyone involved in the project has opted in. Um, to the success of the project, uh, whether or not they were authorized to do so. Cool. Um, and so it's created a very um, fulfilling cross, across the company, across many, many different groups, um, a virtual team that is basically collaborate, collaborating on moving the ball forward in lots of different categories. Um, and... Uh,
Uh, all in comes to living this one point, the, uh, the last event. If you're willing to wear those stats, I will not name the people that took me this lesson. Hello, man. Um, uh -huh. The point is, work to achieve collaborative, collaborative consensus. So people throw all ideas on the table, and most of the times we just talk, 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 we go in different directions, and the group misses the actual problems. And so there must be one test of that. Accurately, if they have a lot of knowledge of a problem, they write down a summary of each different point and make sure that it's going to stop all the conversation that is happening to make sure all that each agreement, at least in some of the points that you summarized. So it's very important to sometimes stop for one second and list the certain, the certain things that we've been discussing to see where is the agreement and where it's not and how to. Respect is productive. And we're trying to come up with a story. We're thinking of like rock bands, the way you know they, as a, as a band comes together, the creative tension of each individual member remains the case. They write these hit songs. And often, when they break apart, the lead singer songwriter just doesn't have the magic. So there's uh, just you know uh, just a healthy amount of friction. So I'm in table uh, three, so um, in my previous life, before I entered this crazy blockchain space, I used to work as a consultant for McKinsey, and one of the things they were really good at is teaching you proper processes, I guess. So one thing which I learned during the training, training and that we agreed on um, in our group also, is, which is quite important, is a um, shared pro problem statement. So that's an evolving kind of document where you, um, first of all, spend a lot of time to formulate like an actionable, measurable problem um, that, that everybody agrees on, but then also like the, the, the um, uh, measures you have at hand to solve that problem. So um, we, yeah, so that's that's one thing uh, we think we thought at our table is very helpful to, to actually make sure also that what you do is, um, or what you come up with in the end um, solves the problem. Table four. Um, so we talk about a lot of things about the mechanics of collaboration and how you make things work while you're doing it. Um, but the thing that we thought was most important to share actually is that uh, it's really important to recognize when we've finished or when, when to stop. Um, and we've all, you know, I'm sure we're all in other groups and other areas where either something's failing, it's never going to work, and everyone's just flogging it, or we did a good job, but now that thing's finished and that standard's body of hire 20 people to work with and the, the job's finished and we should go and spend our efforts somewhere else. Um, so we didn't need a special anecdote because I'm sure we all have a reasonable personal one for um, a work or a private relationship. But um, you know, knowing, knowing when to stop, when to regroup, when to go do something else is actually really important to maintain a healthy collaboration. Um, so table Five, uh, we kind of synthesized the three good ideas into one super secret sauce. Um, and so our story is uh, 
several decades ago, there was a guy, and he was like, you're going to go to the moon, and then they were sort of rivals with this other team that also wanted to go to the moon. And so that's one of our aspects was sort of this collaboration versus competition thing. Uh, and then you also want sort of this cult-like aspect of collaboration, where everyone's, you know, united against a common enemy and has sort of this motivation that's sort of above and beyond. Um, and then you, you know, achieve that. So they actually, the story is they, they went to the and it was pretty fun. Um, so, so those are sort of our aspects, is you, you want competition and collaboration really go hand in hand. Um, and in a lot of cases, you kind of want motivation that is not maybe rational. And I think that's pretty common in a lot of technology, uh, blockchain, or as I call it, Bitcoin, uh, especially, you know, that people are kind of crazy about it. And I think a lot of, you know, I wasn't necessarily around with the first web standards, but I bet there was a lot of crazy people who were like, no, it's got to work this way. Um, so, so those are sort of the secrets. secret sauce was um, fail fast but stay focused. So the idea was that when we when we can prototype at the proper time, we can uh, continually create cons a consensus that is more grounded and create projects that are um, more expedient and focused. It's a project in Costoria where I'm one organization has got the responsibility to sort out the project for customers, but there are other organizations also uh, involved in that problem. So uh, uh, the issue is that uh, 
had sort of pumpkin get jammed and never get to uh, resolve. So uh, in this case, the organization that closes to the customer takes ownership of the problem and they decide to, uh, in order to make it, to explain it to and communicate to uh, other organizations to break down the problem into that so that they break down data silos and then they, they are able to present because they, they, because they had to go to a party and reach out. So, 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 so the key here is that they breaking down the information and also uh, taking ownership of the issue. So ours is going to focus more or less on sidestepping proprietary interests and uh, stale thinking. And there were a couple of examples. One was from the degrees. The MIT has got a blockchain-based uh, degree issuance here, and the way that that collaboration came together, um, uh, it was critical that nobody owned the result. And that's also the experience that I have had trying to do, uh, bring together essentially people and tech. And their uh, endless conversations with various groups who do have ownership interests um, uh, proceed very slowly. And then suddenly, a small group of students in a Paris Law School uh, just picked the thing up, and they taught it to themselves. And they've now, they're now charging ahead. So they don't, they, they don't own any of the ecosystem yet. So they're not inhibited by the problem of who owns. And I'd like to just make one point, which is it might be, as I think our keynote speaker has commented in his wonderful tweet, uh, it might be that what blockchain solves is that ownership problem. Uh, that is, uh, it's a way for folks who uh, ordinarily have got vast vested interests to collaborate with one another without the concern about who ends up owning the ecosystem. Um, so, table number 10, um, as far as I know, it's the only table number 10. Our, our takeaway is encourage early adopters through hands-on play. Um, one of our user stories was um, SVG, for example, started off uh, in 1998, but nobody was using it until 2010 because it wasn't in all the browsers. But before it was in all the browsers, it was an Adobe plugin that Adobe plugin let a, a large community uh, start to play with this and see actually it's visual so you can see what you were doing. You change the code, you look in the browser, you can immediately see your changes. Um, so that encouraged a lot of play and a lot of experimentation. And if it weren't for that early phase of having that plugin, that thing that worked in the browser that everybody could use that was widely deployed, um, it, it wouldn't have gotten wouldn't have had any legs to carry it forward to the long slog of getting it involved in getting it in every browser. And then another user story that was shared at our table similarly was your first first Bitcoin transaction being able to uh, to do that that first time uh, is really an empowering experience. So basically letting people play with the technology, get, putting it into their hands, having something that they can uh, that they can viscerally experience for themselves is a really important part of Uh, one of our key points was talking does not equal communication. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, and uh, I know some of you well enough to know that you hope that I finish this as quickly as possible. And um, and I've been involved in a lot of these groups before, and a lot of times people talk just to talk because they want to feel a sense of participation. But all of our time is precious, and everybody here has specialized knowledge. And if you don't have specialized knowledge about a particular area that people are talking about and they're making progress, then it's, it's sometimes good to exercise restraint and allow that progress to happen rather than just to participate. You can find other goals um, to be able to collaborate and communicate. 
that are productive. And so if you feel like you're being left out or something like that, but everybody's making good progress and you want to uh, participate, that's often a good human instinct. But just try to recognize the balance where your own desires are all holding back the ability of the food to produce. Hi, uh, table 12. Um, we uh, were talking about um, maintaining the distinction between deliberating on a solution and actually coming to a consensus on what that um, solution ought to be. Uh, and often those two are confused and people try to push to finalise something before it has been fully deliberated. So, for example, you might look at the um, debates about block size more topically, so I'm from the UK, if you turn on the news, you may see something about the dangers of voting before you deliberate fully. So. <laughs> Hi, we're table 13. Uh, so I wanted to start with a story. Um, so I work here at the Digital Currency Initiative at the Media Lab, and we're a really interesting group because we have computer scientists former journalists, uh, a politician, ethnographers. We have a really interesting mix of people. And uh, the story I wanted to share is about how um, someone was presenting an idea once in a meeting and the computer scientists immediately started finding security holes in what they were talking about and problems. And this really offended the person and the computer scientists were like, well, this is what we do, you know? Like, we're talking about your idea. We gotta find the, we gotta find the rough edges and stuff. And so um, uh, I think Aline's gonna share the point from the story, so. <laughs> So I think the point is that setting up a conversation is really important. So, for instance, in this case, I think uh, it's very important for, for a journalist or a medical scientist or, or whatever type of research this, this person is doing to understand how, how we're going to communicate this way. So, for instance, uh, if I'm a security researcher, if I should tell these people that, hey, there's going to be a point in the conversation where I'm going to put out my security research and I'm going to attack your idea as a security researcher does. Similarly, maybe it's also uh, what for instance, putting a nice person hat before you put your, your attacker hat on, you know, sort of to recognize the, the, the interest in what's behind the idea. Uh, and I think that helps build consensus about what people actually want to get up with. So that's kind of the point. Setting up the conversation might be very important. And uh, these assumptions like, hey, I'm, I'm going to put this hat on, uh, are, really, are really important to the same across. So our secret sauce is diverse groups finding common ground for mutual discovery. And um, part of that we thought about emergent behavior being um, whole being greater than the sum of its parts. So in that sense, you think about a B5 uh, has a lot more uh, resources at its disposal than this the individual needs. Um, one of the things that we talked also about was connecting to impact. And that speaks to having an end goal of, of some sort in mind uh, part of that way of achieving those things, we think, uh, if influenced by default to being open, is uh, a good way to go. We had a few of us spoke about our different areas, one of which was always having an open door policy, literally. Um, another was one of our individuals had uh, the opportunity to have an open forum where artists as well as engineers were both invited, so there's some diversity there. Um, also, I think. Probably about it. Just having diverse groups finding um, common ground, mutual discovery, defaulting towards open for an end goal of having some connecting by impact. Hello, everybody. I'm from Table 15. Uh, we talked about the great number of topics that are sitting here. Let's go as short as possible. Yes, and Samson, uh, two years ago, he tried to solve a um, web payment solution uh, for merchant serving web payment as much as possible, less dropouts, all that sort of thing. So now, because of the business interest, because of one company, right, we had a big backing of a bank and, uh, and Samson. Samsung. We tried to solve the problem perpetrator or that bank and Samsung Pay. And it worked, well, so it's used there, but after a few years in browser, I learned that you know, proprietary solution for that is a business. 
so then we joined the channel experience and just in here eight months ten months just more having more diverse diverse group and more items are trying to solve the problem more uh, more instances effective collaboration it just blew our mind just the best way it could have happened so no matter what they came up with I'm uh, Ravi from Table 16. Our secret sauce was uh, open communication and listening to one another. In fact, the team was actually building out one other people's stories. So the collaboration worked out very, very well. We had Shippee talked about the red and green flags and IDO, a story where you could give negative feedback as well to build consensus. We had Wendy talked about going into details and getting down to the Modular level that really matters. And once you get there, you'll be able to build the consensus that's in W3 operates. We had Sanjeev Narsipur talked about his experiments with ground sourcing and how he's trying to build that out in terms of building a larger sense of consensus all around and getting that in the ground sourcing platform. We had that talked about getting the context in, and the context piece will help people realize you know, what exactly they are trying to agree upon and build that context with that foundation you can actually build on the agreement. And we had Darrell talked about do the pieces and some of these things that come about. You start the experiment, you do it, you will learn more from it, and then you will build out on that experiment to equal Z2. And finally, we agreed upon the storyline of a milk cooperative in India, which is called uh, Amul. And here you have to build consensus among people who are actually illiterate and they used to sell milk individually. They had to agree and get together across farms, across villages, and across various towns to build out a cooperative society that would work together with each other, preserving individual interest as well as the community interest as a whole. The idea behind the story was if you build the bigger vision where you can show that personal interest can multiply if the group interest is also held, has got a lot of parallels in blockchain and the themes that we are seeing today with the DAO and so on. Then if individual interest can be held back a little bit for a later time and the group interest can actually be supported for a little while longer, the individuals also will gain a lot that we hope we can build better consensus across and collaborate better as well. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, keep these secret sauces in mind because the goal at the end of this event is that we want to collaborate on some things. Um, I also encourage you to keep your cards, uh, you know, the, they're useful. Uh, and then finally, Daza is collecting all of the sheets. If you did not um, bring up your notes, uh, can you please make sure that Daza has uh, the sheets that he can report. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, uh, we got started a little late, and I talked too long, as I usually do. And so we're running a little late. Uh, we have a break right now. Let's try to keep it to five to ten minutes. Uh, so let's be back here in seven minutes. Uh, bathrooms are down there. Hall. And uh, when we come back, we will have Arvind on stage giving us a little keynote speech to inspire us all. Thank you.
that. Um, and so, you know, I, nobody likes a pompous keynote, and that's not what this is. Think of this as more of a conversation starter, and again, heavily influenced by the things that you've said in your position statements. So the big thing that I hope to do today is uh, share uh, some of my excitement for why I think there is a unique opportunity around standardization in the intersection of blockchains and the web. Uh, what the web can do for blockchains and vice versa, and in particular, how it might be possible to marry the power of blockchains with the reach of the web. I want to see if there is a way to get to that. I want to see if there is a way to democratize blockchains. I want to see if there is a way to put those two together. So that's going to be the broad theme. Um, uh, but before I get into that, I want to uh, address one uh, sort of skeptical point as well, which has come out in a couple of the position statements. Wendy made this point as well. What's ready for standardization? Where are we? Is it too premature? Right? Is it too soon? Obviously, I don't have an answer for that. Again, my role here is not to give answers. It's to start the conversation. What I do want to address is one small component of this, which is from a technical perspective, from a computer science perspective. I'm a computer scientist. One question that we can ask, and I think uh, which is important to ask, is are Bitcoin and other blockchains sound? Are they going to be around in something similar to their present form in 10 years, 20 years? I think it's important to try to uh, know the answer to that question to some degree of confidence as we go through this process. And that is something that, as an academic computer security researcher, as part of that community, I can bring something to the table. So one thing I want to share with you is the fact that uh, research on uh, Bitcoin in particular has been very, very vibrant in the academic community. This is a Google Scholar search you can do for yourself, looking at the number of papers that mention Bitcoin. The number per year now is in the thousands. It's, it's uh, sort of stabilizing recently, but as of 2013 or so, it's exploded. Lots of people analyzing Bitcoin. So this does not mean that all of these are papers that are you know, totally about Bitcoin. I would estimate there are maybe a hundred, couple hundred really serious papers per year about Bitcoin, people analyzing the properties of the system. By the way, why am I talking about Bitcoin here, not blockchains? Well, it turns out that from a computer science perspective, there is relatively little of substance that you can say that applies to all blockchains without being specific about which one you're talking about. And that's a point that I will come back to later in a few minutes. What does that mean for us? To what extent can we be successful in sort of abstracting away the properties of specific blockchains and addressing all of them in general? So that's one thing I want to see. So there's been a lot of vibrant research, and academics are certainly incentivized to try to find any uh, underlying problems with the system. A lot of people have been trying to do that. What is the result of all that? I would summarize it with about three points. One, I would say, is that so far, again, this is you know my opinion uh, looking at you know, all of this research. Nobody can read 3,000 papers per year. I'm not claiming, claiming to have a perfect view of this. Oh, yes, Brian Bishop has all, read almost 3,000 papers uh, per year. Big kudos to him. But this is sort of my uh, summary of, the, uh, of what's uh, been happening in the academic community. So I would say that there are no major fundamental problems that have been discovered so far. So again, so far as I can. There are certainly various known concerns. Perhaps uh, one of the best known ones is selfish mining. Most of you may have heard about that. Uh, and you know that's it's one of maybe uh, uh, several other such potential problems, looming problems uh, that have been discovered uh, by academics as well as others in the Bitcoin research community. But one of the pieces of good news is that even though there are these problems that have been come out uh, through a sort of a theoretical analysis, it seems that so far Bitcoin has been working a lot better in practice than it's supposed to in theory, and that's been a phenomenon that's come out over and over and over again. People are getting wise to that now, and they're trying to refine their theoretical models in order to better model and understand and predict how Bitcoin has been working and will continue to work. So this is, I, I would say, overall good news, and this is something positive from the point of view of standardization. In a certain sense, the underlying technology is ready, and also from a teaching perspective, let me tell you, um, some of you may know, I, uh, me and others at Princeton did an online course on Bitcoin, 35,000 people took it, huge amount of interest, we did a textbook. So it turns out that uh, 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 many instructors around the world are starting to see Bitcoin as a way of introducing many crypto and computer science ideas to undergraduates and to uh, computer science students. And so I think these ideas are going to get a lot of traction in the process of research and education. And I think we'll have uh, a lot of resources to draw upon. So it's a healthy situation. I, I will offer one caveat, and that caveat is endpoint security. What do I mean by that? People getting their uh, servers and other things hacked, losing Bitcoins. Uh, companies uh, uh, going down uh, because of uh, security issues. 
this is a bit different from the underlying issue of the stability of Bitcoin itself. But when it comes to endpoint security, I think the situation has been, I, I won't mince words here. And so far, it's been pretty miserable. We all kind of know that. This just came out yesterday. This is uh, called the Blockchain Graveyard. Pretty cool thing. I encourage you to look it up. This is by Magoo from Coinbase, uh, talking about a lot of different uh, companies and, uh, and uh, uh, websites that went under because of security problems and what we can learn from that. So one way in which I would summarize this is that human crypto interaction, as I call it, is an unsolved problem. Not clear if we will ever solve it for regular mainstream users to be able to handle public and private keys securely. And so I think that is one thing that we should really keep in mind during the standardization effort. Is it possible to abstract away some of those details from end users if we want to really democratize blockchains and if we want to really marry it with the power of each the web? I will also uh, point out one other caveat. There is uh, a, a difference both between the amount of research and the conclusions when you talk about Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Ethereum is the red line at the bottom there. Obviously, it's a much newer system, not, not that much research so far. But also, compared to Bitcoin, uh, there is some amount of concern about the fundamental security of the system, both about underlying incentive misalignment issues, as I call them. Uh, what's good for individual actors in Ethereum might not be uh, what's good for the overall health of the system. Bitcoin itself has been remarkably successful at aligning these two. With Ethereum, this is not quite so clear. There are also concerns about the ability of people to write secure contracts that we can reason about and which we can secure properly. And of course, you've all heard about uh, or have been following in the news the story about the DAO, and that's an object lesson, I think. So these are things to keep in mind. So there's, you know, vibrant research, both in academia and of course, the university, the university is much more than that. It's very optimistic that it'll be in a different place in a few years. But at this point, I would say there are concerns about the stability and security of the theory. So now let me get to the big thing that I find very inspiring about being at this place at this time, which is can standardization enable new applications? Sometimes, Sometimes we say that things like, like document formatting, uh, believe me, that's really important and you get to do that that allows you know, different applications to talk to each other. But sometimes standardization ends up enabling something a little bit uh, fundamentally new. And uh, as an example, I would give uh, the introduction of cookies to the web. And standardization, coupled with a little bit of graphical functionality, very trivial functionality, sending the feature to the server every time you encounter the server. But fundamentally, also the character of the web, it made a lot of new applications possible, both for good and bad. It has some negative effects as well. That is something to keep in mind. But I want to say there are less sort of opportunity that we can exploit in the blockchain world when we provide something possible. Have, you know, with standardization, add a little bit of browser functionality, enable something. Is that possible? So I'm going to give you one example of this where I think this might be possible. I'm not saying this is the one thing we should focus on by any means. But it's just meant to act as a, a, a you know, a, to prove the point that uh, something like this might be within our reach. Imagine, I want you to imagine, five to ten years in the future, a user, either through a web browser or, let's say, even an IoT device that's web enabled. Now, what they're trying to do is they're interacting with some server or a service provider. And what they're saying is, um, basically, uh, issuing a command to do something on the blockchain. What I mean by do this, I will make that more concrete in a moment. Uh, the key thing I want to point out is that it's an untrusted server. Uh, the client is not trusting the server, and I want to point out that this is a thin client, which I've noted in my book. So as uh, many of you are familiar with the notion of Bitcoin thin clients, I'm sort of generalizing that notion. The client doesn't have much functionality in general, really wants to rely on the server, but doesn't want to clean. Now, the server carries out that task, but in addition, it does this one key thing which is enabled by the blockchain, which is it says, I've done that, and here is the proof. And this notion of proof, as many of you know, is one of the cool things that blockchain enables cryptographic proofs that the client can verify. And I'm going to claim that this is really important, this is something that we should keep in mind in the standard condition. Why does this enable powerful things? Imagine in this vision of the future, the browser over here, just like a secure site today, it shows a green lock in the browser. Uh, address bar, and the user doesn't need to know much else, basically handles the verification. And the user is happy and convinced that whatever action they gave, whatever command they issued, has been successfully completed on the blockchain. 
imagine what that world would enable. A lot of different applications. Again, I read all of your position statements. Uh, many different threads of applications came out of that. Uh, things like contracts, not even talking about smart contracts at this point, just legal contracts that we might want to timestamp right on the blockchain, just basic document timestamping. Uh, provenance, uh, both for uh, creative content as well as for IP and assets and so on. Lots of people excited about IoT. I read position statements from IBM and uh, uh, VT and so on. And again, identity was another uh, really important final thread. So think about any of these applications. Um, let's say, think about, for example, uh, you're renting an apartment, you walk into the landlord, you have a thin client over here, uh, the landlord's computer uh, connects to some backend server, which is connected to the blockchain. Uh, you sign the document, and where's that music coming from? Is that my phone? Somebody's phone here has an alarm going on. I don't know if you know whose it is. It'd be nice to. Uh, for the moment, yeah, I tried to cancel it. Not, not working. Okay, thank you. Um, so imagine you do this, and your landlord timestamps that onto the blockchain and sends uh, beams through Bluetooth or whatever that proof to your mobile phone. And your mobile phone, being a thin client, not being a node on the Bitcoin network, is still able to, through your mobile apps or browser's trusted interface, web-based interface, is able to convince you, the user, that the landlord has done this correctly and that the document that you just signed has been timestamped onto the blockchain. You can imagine a similar thing for in the identity space, for uh, creative content, uh, for whatever you want. So I claim that this sort of model, if we can enable it through standards, is going to be a way to combine the power of the blockchain with the reach of the web. Because this enables uh, the use of the blockchain to anybody with just a web browser without having to interact directly with the underlying crypto. And what the standardization process would have to deal with here is thinking about what this means and what is the language for that and what is the set of things we want to be able to express. And in the reverse direction, when the server sends a proof back to the client, what does that proof mean? Who's going to verify? Is that in the browser? Is that a browser add-on? What is the user interface for confirming to the user that the proof has been correctly verified? So there's a little bit of work that uh, we have to do to figure out exactly how to operationalize this. But if we can, my feeling is that the power that this is going to unlock is going to be really tremendous. And uh, today, with or without standards, I don't think we have anything quite like this that is possible. And just as an aside, I want to make a quick technical point. Uh, when I say uh, proofs here, uh, what do I mean? And I want to show you a simple example, a technical example of how one of these proofs. Uh, let me start. Uh, let me show you the, the simplest possible proof, where the client simply says to the server to put a specific piece of data onto the blockchain, and the server sends back. So what does this look like? Visually, um, what's going to happen is this is what the blockchain looks like. You've all seen vertical trees that are connected together by these hash pointers. And and the piece of data that you want to write onto the blockchain is going to be one of the nodes in this tree. So it's going to be this node over here, for example. Now, what does it mean for the server to prove to you that it has written this data into the blockchain? Many of you may have seen this, but if you haven't seen it, this is what I mean by efficient proofs. This is the, the data structure called Merkle trees, and this is what it's enabled. What the server can give you is only these pieces of data that are highlighted. You don't have to care about most of the currently 70 gigabytes of the blockchain. You only have to care about a very small, in computer science terms, logarithmic amount of data. And this will enable any simple, dumb client to verify by following these cryptographic hash pointers and by looking at the proofs of work and checking for six confirmations whenever you want to check that the piece of data you're interested in has been written to the blockchain by the server that you don't even trust. That's the magic that it enables. The server does all the work, you don't trust the server, yet you can be cryptographically convinced that it's accurate. Let me give you one other example. Identity has been a huge topic here. I know a lot of you are interested in that. Uh, let's say a, a another a slightly different scenario. The client wants to ask a server a question, wants to ask, uh, the client has a particular user, a friend, let's say, in mind. Uh, the client knows the friend's handle, wants to ask, what is the point? The server can say, here's the answer. You can verify this yourself. And what I want to envision, what I think we can make possible, is I'm borrowing here a, a graphic from Blockchain B, which is one of the identity efforts. There are many of these, but they have this nice graphic, so I borrowed it here. So imagine if the server could send some representation of this identity information back to the client, and the client's trusted interface, web-based interface, verifies all of this information, and so the client can simply trust that what they're seeing reflects what's actually on the page. I think we should be able to enable that. 
So in other words, what I'm saying here is that standardization could be a way to bypass this messy process of human crypto intervention. That's sort of the term that I like to use of users manually having to know what public private keys are, having to check signatures, so on and so forth. Let me give you one other technical example of a slightly more complex proof because I think it illustrates an important point. Now, here, this is the sort of thing that you can imagine in a system like Namecoin, if some of you know about that. So uh, the client could ask, what is the IP address corresponding to a particular domain name? So this is a blockchain-based domain name system. It's a replacement for a centralized ICANN-based domain name system. The client asks the server, what is the IP address for this domain name? The server says, here is a record, here's a transaction record that maps this domain name, example.bit, that bit is an alternative uh, hierarchy for namecoin based domain names, uh, to this particular uh, IP address, xxyyzz. Now, do you think it's enough? Do you think it is sufficient if the server approves the statement over here to the client for the clients to be convinced that xyzz is the IP address that it is? No, exactly. Because that domain name might have changed hands, there might be a newer record. So the server also has to prove this additional statement saying there is no future record after this record that uh, uh, that concerns uh, this particular example .bit domain. So you can see this is a more complex notion of a proof. This won't fit into the simple Merkle tree based proof that I showed in the previous slide. So this leads to, if we want to uh, enable a broader set of applications, leads to a very interesting set of questions for standardization. Uh, you know, should we standardize a specific small set of proofs? This is similar to Bitcoin's approach of whitelisting a few different scripts. Or should we standardize a language for proofs, similar to Ethereum's approach of having a uh, Turing complete system? And I know that many of you have thought about this. I read this uh, proposal for fiduciary signatures, where the authors have clearly done a lot of thinking for these language for proofs. Uh, again, a lot of great ideas. I don't have any answers here, but these are, I think, important questions that we should Let's take this a little bit farther. Let me show you just how much potential there is here that can be unlocked. I want to claim that in this scenario, verifiers could even be offline. Think about a typical IoT space. Uh, in this one, I'm using the example of a car that can be opened by a digital key. I want to say that we can enable the following scenario. If you want to, for example, uh, loan your car to your friend for a, a period of a day, what you could do uh, in this hypothetical world is they could have a USB-based car key and the car key with a USB port, uh, into which you can upload some information pertaining to the protocol that might happen in this scenario. The car queries the key and asks who are you, and the key says, never mind who I am, here is a proof, here is a cryptographic proof uh, that uh, shows that I'm authorized to drive you for a you know, some period of time starting at some and uh, the car uh, can verify this using information, uh, uh, including proof of work and so on. Now, I, I do want to point out a caveat that if you go to this offline model, you're losing certain security properties. You go into a weaker security model. And I know that there are people who are even uncomfortable with the notion of thin Bitcoin clients instead of full-fledged Bitcoin clients in terms of slightly weaker security properties. Uh, but my position on this is that the opportunity here is just so enormous that we should try to identify and fix the security issues and improve the security properties instead of going away from the scenario altogether. And I will admit, I'm a little bit biased here. Uh, so the win here for me is not having to put internet in not just cars, but also toasters and every little IoT device in order to have it interoperate with the blockchain. What if we could do it without having to do that, either without having to even connect it, or at a minimum, only putting a thin client onto those devices. I'm sure that most of you follow the Internet of Shit Twitter account has been cataloging all of the things that have been going disastrously wrong in the last couple of years with putting a chip and uh, full internet access into toasters and everything else. If you don't follow this, by the way, forget about my talk. You should go follow the internet of shit right now. That's the most important thing that you'll learn from this talk. Um, but my take on this is that standards can be a way to keep uh, these clients thin and dumb and I'm using both of those in sort of and, and technical uh, senses here. I know that a lot of companies here are interested in IoT uh, and marrying that with the blockchain, I'd love to hear your take on what you think is the right approach here. So um, I, I want to make a, a couple of uh, more points. This was the primary idea that I wanted to communicate this opportunity here. Uh, but I want to make a couple more points. And one is that it matters which blockchain we're talking about. Because let's go back to this visual. Imagine this notion of the client telling the server to do something on the blockchain. 
and the server communicates back the proof. Even if it is the case that different ledgers are able to do roughly the same set of things, or you can identify a subset of things that most of them can do, even if you can standardize this part, the word this here, this word proof down here, is going to be pretty difficult to standardize across different ledgers. And if you don't do that, then you've only solved half of them. And let me explain what I mean by that. So this part is going to really depend on the blockchain. And one example of where this really comes into play is public versus private blockchains. So uh, why is this the case? Let me uh, permit me for a moment to sort of deconstruct private blockchains here. I'm going to use private blockchains interchangeably with uh, permission ledgers. And, and if any of you use them in a different sense, I'd love to know, but for me, they're going to be the same. So what do private blockchains have in common? What do they have different from compared to you know, Bitcoin's blockchain? They keep the notion of an append only log using hash pointers and virtual trees that I showed you in a previous graphic. They keep the notion of cryptographic identity. They throw away the notion of proof of work. Obviously, private blockchains don't need that. They throw away this cool Nakamoto consensus concept, which is one of the primary innovations behind Bitcoin. And of course, they dispense with the need for a currency. And a lot of different private blockchains have also gone back to this notion of Byzantine consensus protocols, which go back in the computer science literature to that. I want to say the 1980s, I'm not exactly sure, but it's many decades ago. The point I want to make here is that, you know, this is, an, it, it is a different technical configuration. Um, most of the technical components, or all the technical components that exist in private blockchains, go back decades in the computer science literature. I mean, this idea of Merkle trees, people were putting roots of Merkle trees in the newspaper before anybody had heard of the blockchain. This is a company called Guard Time that collects documents from its clients, enterprise clients piles them into a Merkle tree of hashes and puts the root hash as an advertisement in the newspaper so that it's published for all the world to see. So every idea that's in private blockchains actually has a pedigree going back really for decades. Now, why am I saying this? So I, I want to also point out to one really funny tweet that to me really brings, uh, 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 explains why private blockchains have been so successful. This person argues that they've been sort of a stone soup for capital market technologies. In other words, it's the buzz around Bitcoin and its blockchain that have brought all these banks and all these entities to the table uh, to discuss this new set of, uh, or supposedly new set of technologies, whereas all the underlying actual technical components behind private blockchains really go back to the 90s and 80s in the computer science literature. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because private blockchains have dispensed with proof of work with Nakamoto consensus. That means this component here, what the blockchain is going to be able to prove to you about its operation is totally different from public blockchains. It's going to be totally different from uh, for Ethereum or if you look at some other uh, um, uh, blockchain. Methods. So this is something we should keep in mind. Uh, a number of different um, um, uh, you know, commenters, uh, I believe from Hyperledger, Digital Bazaar, IPFS, have proposed this notion of interlinking different ledgers together. I think that is good. That is important. We should do that. I do also want us to keep in mind that they have vastly different security properties. So we should think about what happens when we link or combine them, what happens to the security. Uh, that's a notion that I want to bring to the floor here. I only have a couple of minutes, so let me um, jump to my last point here, which is a note of caution. If you've heard me speak on this topic before, you knew I was going to get to this. But, uh, but often there is a tendency in the blockchain world to sort of jump too far and try to seek new technical solutions to social media. You've all seen this. I see nods in the audience. I don't even have to explain it. Um, uh, so I want to offer a note of caution on that. Instead of me explaining it, I want to just read one quote from, uh, from Angela Walsh from one of the uh, uh, submissions in the Tokyo uh, submissions that were posted on the website. She says, when messing with medicine or property records or finance, you're dealing with the lives and resources of individuals. This is exciting, but it also carries a heavy responsibility. Right? This is something I want to urge us to keep in mind. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that here's the new thing I want to say. I want to suggest that standardization can actually act as a key check in this process of sort of preventing us from trying to seek technical solutions to social problems. We can do that in many ways because it offers an opportunity for introspection to ask us, is this technology that we're putting on a pedestal in which we're standardizing, is that going to be applicable the world over? Is it the right one for everyone? What are the benefits? What are also the costs? Can we think critically about the potential harms of this technology? Standardization forces us to do that. It also acts as a point of point of regulation for how we want to use this technology. And finally, it imparts legibility. Some of you may know this term uh, from books like Seeing Like the State. What I mean here is standardization, while it's primarily a process of getting uh, computers to communicate with each other, 
the process of documenting and specifying what we're doing also allows the technology to be legible, so to speak, to people like lawyers, to people like uh, 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 you know, regulators who want to come in and have a discussion about how we're using this technology in our social world. And so I know that today, uh, these two days are a days for technical discussion, but the, for the, in terms of the broader standardization process, I would love for us to keep this in mind. I would love for technologists to reach across the table and use this as an opportunity to think critically about the place of blockchains in our society. And with that, I'll just put away, put here the, uh, uh, the takeaway and points for discussion throughout my talk. I won't, I won't repeat them, and uh, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Arvin, thank you so much. Uh, Marta, are you here? Uh, do you want to come on up? Marta is going to be uh, the uh, host for the. Uh, identity uh, lightning talks and um, everybody who's doing an identity lightning talk, have you talked to them already? Is Vladimir here? Okay. Um, if he gets here in time, I guess he can do a lightning talk. Uh, Daniel, I guess you're first. So my name is Daniel Buckner. Uh, I work at Microsoft. Uh, specifically, I work on blockchain identity uh, systems that are built around it. It's a really important piece of any of the blockchain work that we have with us. So here is the presentation. So I, I think really what, what blockchain can enable are a few key things. Identity is huge. Uh, I really think it's going to transform our world and create a, a web that's bigger than anything we've seen. Bigger than sites, bigger than, than FTP and files, bigger than you know, all these present use cases. It's going to come to define the fabric of how everything interacts with each other in the world. Um, so blockchain, you know, people say, what is blockchain? Well, it, it's really, it's, it's a lot of things that already exist, right? Like, it's easy to dismiss because, you know, we've had cryptography and, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks are here. Sean Parker is, you know, growing gray hair now. And uh, consensus algorithms aren't new. There's maybe a inside of this particular protocol. But really it's because of these things being put together in this delightful package. Right? It's a lot like a lot like Apple does when they take, you know, first created the iPhone. Right? Touchscreens existed, technically apps were on other platforms, all these things existed in constituent parts, but what they did was bring them together in a way that was delightful. So you prove that you own these tokens, whatever you want to value them as or have them stand for. It's decentralized, distributed, and most importantly, it's a proof of ownership that's secure. So, you know, cryptographically secure transactions sent through a worldwide network, global ledger, um, a chronological state of ownership for every participant involved in the system. And that's important because those are the same qualifications we need for something else called identity. What is that? Well, identity is a collection of attributes, activities, and interactions, So the brass tacks, a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there about, you know, what, what do we need for identity? Chris Rallon uh, out there, you know, he has these 10 facets. They're very technical facets. For what an identity must comprise. You know, you know, you know, you have Kim Cameron at Microsoft, you find the seven laws. This is more of a product centric view. So what we need to really enable the decentralized apps, services, all sorts of other stuff that we need out of this system. Well, it has to be an open system. Microsoft can't go create another proprietary thing and say, great, here's the identity for well, I don't think anyone's going to listen to us. Um, it's got to be user sovereign, so it can't be touchable by bad actors, enemies. Um, even the greatest government, you know, like the best people, can't be trusted to own you. So it has to be something that's owned by the people. Uh, it's memorable identifiers, huge, important piece. We can 
argue that, oh, you know, we, should, we want complete anonymity in Hawaii, but we think that that's important. It's also important that memorable identifiers can be created, because when I'm walking around at a conference looking at people's lanyards, I'm not going to be memorizing a 32-bit picture. Um, indexable registering. So I should be able to register these identifiers in a single place. When I can look to one place to say, I know, I know his name was Dan, or Dan got it, whatever that identifier is, I need to be able to go find it and know where I'm going to find it. And then obviously, semantic data. So the thing at the other end of that identity must be semantic. I have to understand what it means. So when I reach out and grab it, um, not, you know, everyone's identity is different from another. So here's the first claim. Identity, the identity opportunity blockchain presents is historic and unprecedented. Why is that? Well, we've had signed, uh, signed data backed by public, public private keys for a long, long time. But when you add that to what we already talked about blockchain being, which was this proof of ownership, um, we can start registering transactions on a blockchain that reserve names. And that becomes interesting because, um, no, I can't. So once you can start registering names, essentially co-opting the transactions on a blockchain to do this, you can build links out to identity data and then a registry of that data. Um, so I could essentially build a name system, which is incredibly important because this name system is unknown. Second claim, an open user sovereign global identity system will be integrated with almost every product, service, object, inanimate object, and human activity you can possibly imagine. And this includes use cases like licenses, agreements, documentation, attestation, real time data, Here's probably the most wild claim. I think that, I truly believe that the data that comprises all those use cases I just listed will not live in any fashion on the blockchain. We'll talk about the source data on the blockchain. We'll talk about getting, you know, generating a Merkle hash, and putting the hash in the blockchain. All those things are irrelevant. Um, instead, they'll be enabled and anchored by blockchain identities. Uh, we know there's a scale problem with blockchains. There is, and it's for a reason, it's for a good reason. So there might be a better way. So let's take a look at one example. Uh, I have a person, you know, Jane, she's going to buy a car. There's a lender involved and a saleswoman. So the, the normal way that this would be done in a lot of these blockchain scenarios, what people aspire to, is they create some sort of loan object and, and they, uh, you know, have the source data. You have to keep it because if there's ever a dispute for the loan, you say, well, what's on line nine, you know, uh, character four, right? I have to actually be able to go look up the loan. A hash doesn't do me anything, right? Like if I take a hash of that and put it on a blockchain, and I lose the source material, guess what it's worth? Nothing, right? Like if someone disputes that one, they have to produce it. So you get nothing. So it's important to remember that. So instead do this, have everyone in the system, even the car itself, have a blockchain based identity. When the dealership generates that loan object, Jane, uh, it's generated by the saleswoman, she signs it, the lender bill, he signs it with his blockchain identity. Um, Jane agrees to those terms, so she signs the object with her blockchain identity. Understand that nothing that occurred here happened on the blockchain. Their identities that are rooted in the blockchain, so they waterfall that trust, right? So I'm signing these objects, and in the end, I give a copy of, of this boldly signed object to everyone in the group, and at any point in the future, they can bear that object to prove multiple things. It contains the source. It contains a verification of everyone that agreed to it. Um, and it's proven. Um, and the, the result here is, is the, the point of all this, and where I think we want to head with identity, and hope you will join us with, is that we can enable line speeds, we can enable things at line speed with identity, without clogging a blockchain that are enabled by a blockchain. And it's something incredibly important to keep in your mind as you're listening to the use cases over the next two days, and all the systems that we're going to talk about. Maybe there's a really efficient way Next will be uh, Thomas uh, Ar Arjano, Arjano uh, talking about self-source verifiable identities for future blockchains. Uh, and as uh, Thomas is setting up, uh, I wanted to just uh, tell you that we decided to talk about uh, identity first. I'm not sure if we talked about it. Uh, because uh, as the steering committee, we really believe that 
identity is one of the most important uh, issues or something that would span in our conversations uh, throughout the whole two days. So we wanted to kind of get it out of the way uh, as one of the biggest issues of the blockchain. Um, we hope that you agree with us and that's why this is like the first series of Python talks that we'll have. We will later on move to the other big issues uh, that we'll Folks, uh, just a quick intro. I uh, work in, uh, in a group on MIT Connection Science. Uh, you can see a few faces from the group here. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, I'm going to talk about identity, trust, and data, which is the three things that are inseparable. So, you know, people like to talk about identity. Great, I'm, I'm big on that. We've been doing that for, for almost two decades. There's the issue of trust, and there's also the issue of data. And data could mean uh, data is in raw data, it could be in uh, metadata, but identity is. So uh, it's a lightning talk, so I'm just going to do like four or five slides. So so the big question is, does blockchain technology solve the following three things uh, that we care about? So the identity problem. So does it uh, help us uh, with this uh, question of the quality of an identity uh, system or more specifically the security of a digital representation of an identity? Um, does it help us uh, in the of independence that an identity has. So we love to talk about self-sovereign identities, but how do you measure that? How, how sovereign is an identity? What's, what's the gating factor? What's the source of an identity? So I, I could argue that, that uh, the source of my identity is my parents. So a baby doesn't get to say what uh, his or her identity is going to be. It's, it's always uh, your parents. In fact, in traditional societies, um, it's a community decision, right? So, so um, the parents might say, well, here's my new baby, name is Joe Blow, you live in a village, great. Uh, the village is going to be, to be the entity that's going to attest to that name henceforth. So if you look at traditional societies, you see people's last names are usually the, the village name, you know, Joe from whatever, Cambridge, right? And when Joe Cambridge goes to, you know, um, to meet, you know, Bill Newton, Village, right? There is a, there is there's something going on there, right? So this is it's not all straightforward. Uh, so um, so that's that's an issue. So there's an issue with um, I'm just going to list a whole bunch of you know questions I have about this uh, issue of privacy, binding to real world uh, attributes and reputations, the provenance of an identity, the, the trustworthiness, and availability and persistence. So if you're using an identity, a digital identity, uh, to transact today. Is going to archive it if you get called the question, you know, 10 years from now it's going to be available. Uh, is it reputable or reputable if I'm transacting with it um, and I don't, I, I lose the key, what's going to happen? Right? So these are all classic, classic problems. So does blockchain solve the data problem, right? So we sit the other side. Um, so, so this is, this is the pain point. Just looking at the industry today, uh, it's, it's data loss prevention, DLP industry that have just grown in the past five years. People know what I'm talking about, DLP, heard of it. If you haven't, don't worry about it. So organizations are holding massive amounts of data, right? Which is great. Um, people want to do analytics, people are running Hadoop infrastructures and Spark, Spark infrastructures. They want to have the terabytes of data at, you know, in their premise. Well, guess what? That doesn't scale. You can't share data across institutions, their regulatory uh, limitations, uh, transporter uh, issues, and so on. But just for individual enterprises holding user data, um, they are a great attraction for hackers. People remember the Anthem uh, database. So, you know, nothing was lost, but a whole bunch of records were copied, right? And so how do you solve this issue? Um, what is the ownership of data? So, so there are now, in fact, organizations in Europe who are saying, you know, end user, you know, here's your data. You can, you can take it back because we don't want the liability. So, so how, how does blockchain technology help this? Um, how does uh, blockchain technology allow uh, metadata to be indexed and searched? Does that help? These are, these are issues. The trust problem. So this is the hard part, right? When you come to talk about digital identities, it's a trust problem. The digital identities. A, I like to talk about technical trust and social trust, 
uh, technical trust is a big thing in trusted computing because technical trust basically implements uh, cryptography. And, and I like to say, you know, in cryptography, you can trust. People know that, that phrase, right? That just gives you technical trust. It doesn't give you legal trust. It doesn't give you social trust. Social trust is most often encoded as legal, right? So people, uh, people who are working in the identity space would know what a legal trust framework is for identity. So, so we need we need to solve that problem. We need to standard. If there's anything that needs to be standardized, it would be a legal trust framework for uh, identity sharing and for data sharing. These do not really exist. Identity, yes, but definitely not data sharing. Uh, trustless is not equivalent to trustworthy. This decentralization doesn't map automatically to trust. Right? Just because something is on a blockchain, it doesn't mean trust. There's a social trust. There's issue the, the, the legal trust. Um, uh, finally, we have to think of, uh, we have another problem, which is the privacy problem. So uh, our group at, at, the, uh, at MIT here is, is working on a new paradigm based on these three principles. principles of law. Never allow raw data to leave your repository. Right? This, is, this is breaking out the Hadoop model. Big data analy uh, in a, uh, analytics will, will need to change. And data needs to be encrypted at all times. That means data uh, in operation or at rest must be this is why people are spending a lot of time on homomorphic encryption. This is why MIT Enigma, the Enigma project, is gaining a lot of interest because it, it provides an avenue for a solution. Always return aggregate answers. Right? So these are the three principles. Uh, we think that blockchain technology, peer-to-peer -peer nodes, will have a role, particularly for something like Enigma, where you have a distributed repository always encrypted, where you can actually run queries over the encrypted nodes. Okay, that was my thing. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, Vladimir has arrived. I guess not. Uh, then uh, Ryan, are you here? Yes, you are. Uh, so Ryan will talk about uh, self-sovereign identity with Blockstack and Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Good to see you. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so my name is Ryan Shea, and I'm with Blockstack. And how many of you have heard of Blockstack? Who knows? Cool, awesome. Um, and who here knows one name? Okay, cool. So we, um, so uh, I'm with. Um, an open source movement called Blockstack. Uh, the company that I work for is called Blockstack Labs, and we work on the protocol and contribute. Uh, and we also created a, an applica consumer application called OneName. And uh, just a little bit more about who we are. So um, this is our, our core team. Uh, it's myself. The, 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 the size? The font size. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Can't really, you don't. It's not. You don't have to read it. I can. I'll make sure in the future slides that the font size is bigger. Um, so, so yeah. So that's me, my co-founder Manib, um, uh, Guy, and Jude. Uh, we have uh, two computer science PhDs from Princeton. We also have uh, two Princeton professors uh, as advisors, um, and uh, who've worked on the P2P systems uh, for for decades. Um, we are the most um, most popular, most used uh, layer two protocol on the Bitcoin blockchain. That means um, outside of Bitcoin for financial transactions, uh, block stack transactions represent the largest system on top of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and because the Bitcoin blockchain really only has, it's the only blockchain with meaningful use, uh, that also means that it's the most used protocol across all blockchains. Um, this is an older graphic, but this is, uh, 
basically the uh, growth of identity registrations over time. Um, it has since surpassed this, uh, but we continuously get new registrations, and, uh, and so we are, um, we, re we actually represent, uh, Blockstack represents uh, one of the uh, largest um, systems to date. But um, that's just a little quick introduction. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about digital identity for a second. So when we talk about digital identity, we can refer to many different things. I think people often are referring to people, but it can also refer to organizations, devices, uh, and ideas, right? And since money is an idea, right? Um, but I want to focus on people right now. And when we're talking about identity, there's kind of two interrelated concepts that we're talking about. One is this idea of entity persistence, um, and another is a bundle of attributes. So uh, with entity persistence, all you care about is this is the same thing that I was referring to before. Is this is the same thing that I saw before. Once you have entity persistence, you can actually build bundles of attributes on top of those persistent entities. Um, oftentimes, we don't actually have true entity persistence. And so what we do is we use the bundles of attributes as a proxy to inform this entity persistence. So for example, um, you if I go out and leave the room and I come back, you might not know I'm the same person, but you look at my physical features and deduce that I'm the same person. But if I had a twin, I could actually be a different person. So because you don't have that continuity of observation of something, then we actually don't have true entity persistence in the real world unless we have physical cam unless we have cameras everywhere. But um, what's really interesting is with the blockchain, we can actually get true entity persistence. Um, in the digital identity world, we can get a, uh, entity persistence by uh, through digital keys, right? Uh, so long as that key system doesn't get broken, uh, and we can also have um, users sign challenges for their keys to prove to, to continuously authenticate uh, throughout time. Um, and then, when it comes to bundles of attributes, users can sign statements about themselves, and then other people can sign statements about them. And uh, there are multiple entities that can corroborate uh, these statements. So uh, I'm going to introduce a few uh, concepts here. First, I'm going to say that when uh, a user owns an account and there's no context around that account, I'm just going to refer to that as basic identity. Uh, if there are self-attested attributes, <coughs> I'm going to call that contextual identity. And then if uh, there's attestations from trusted parties, then we can refer to that as a level of verified identity. And if it's managed by the person's digital keys, then we can say that it is self-sovereign identity, as in the user has sovereignty over themselves. So we move on to identity with the blockchain. And we can ask ourselves, well, why do we actually need a blockchain for this? Um, and the reasons for that are, one, we want to build an identity system that's as global and universal as the internet. Um, we want something that supports secure information transfer. And we want it to be resilient. We want it to be free from identity theft and social engineering. And various properties of the blockchain can allow us to achieve that. Um, Certain things belong in the blockchain, certain things don't. Digital keys, domain names, pointers and hashes belong in the blockchain. Things that don't belong in the blockchain are both public and private user data, self-signed uh, attestations, and, and uh, third-party attestations. Um, let's get through this. So um, going back to Blockstack real quick, um, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, there is this block stack network that operates as a layer on top of Bitcoin, and there are multiple clients that operate on top. So th this is this is kind of how we thought of it in terms of building a truly decentralized system for, for naming and identity of public key infrastructure. Um, skip past this. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I, I want to go into, uh, as in the last section, what, um, what the power of blockchain identity is and what it can so blockchain identities can replace passports, driver's licenses, student ID cards, social security numbers, passwords, Facebook, Twitter, Google login, physical keys and key cards, security questions. The, if we really want to have a universal identity that can be used in all kinds of different contexts, with privacy features, of course, and with, with features where you can you know, do a minimal disclosure proof uh, that, you, that you actually um, have authorization to access something, uh, then we can say that that it, it's more convenient for the user if we can have something that's, that, that works across all different contexts. Um, blockchain identities can be useful in, in financial services, healthcare, government services, Internet of Things, armed forces. We really have the uh, potential to create something that is um, truly universal, is powerful, is um, it's similar to how email and password. The email and password is a fairly universal um, 
identity system, um, but it is very primitive and has lots of problems. So if we want something that is similar to that in, in its universality, but has a lot more capabilities and a lot more security, uh, then, then we need something that, uh, that is an open standard and is on an open platform. And that's where blockchain identity comes in, and that's why it's, it's Can you can check this out if you want uh, more information on it. And thank you guys very much. So I, I'm going to describe a, a pilot that uh, uh, we're working on uh, for uh, to demonstrate self-sovereign support technology and the decentralized ID um, uh, for a medical prescription uh, in, in the regulated and uh, real-world sense. Uh, I participate in standards and policy development from the privacy engineering perspective, and so in effect I'm sort of... Uh, I loved Arvin's uh, takeaway uh, about uh, what we're doing here uh, in terms of uh, both the standards and uh, real social impact. Um, so, what uh, we're trying to do is to use the blockchain to reduce the liability of the institutional participants while promoting innovation overall in the, in the system. And so, what you're looking up here is that a, a medical prescription involves four parties, uh, two self-sovereign of an individual that's not a medical position, and two institutions. In this case, the pharmacy, uh, which is a uh, regulated uh, institution, it could be a vendor, like the FDA or the DEA or anything, and the medical society, which is in effect managing, is an institution managing the license of the physician, you understand it for that. Um, so, um, if you go to the So uh, basically, the, uh, uh, the patient is accountable, the MD is licensed, the medical society is authoritative, and the pharmacy is regulated. So if we can pilot and demonstrate standards and uh, how this would work in, in real life, I think this is a, a reasonably uh, broad use case for what's going on here. Um, as I said, uh, the goal is to reduce the liability all parties, and Thomas uh, uh, made that uh, point himself. Uh, the blockchain on the, uh, removes the middleman in this case. Right now, we're used to having something like a hospital that accredits both the physician and identifies the patient. And in effect, that, that becomes a, a drag on innovation uh, in the overall uh, sense. So the idea is to show us this concept, pilot the standards for self-sovereign technology, particularly in the case of the technology that's used by the physician and the patient to interact with each other. And it basically will evolve three core standards, uh, the distributed ID, uh, the authorization for how personal information moves from one uh, place to another, and, uh, and a transaction hash uh, as a digital postmark in order to deal with compliance issues. And so finally, there's a, there's a bit of the address there uh, that stands for uh, self-sovereign support technology and uh, distributed ID, where you can find more details about uh, what's going on. Thank you. Okay, so Vladimir, have you showed up? Um, I guess not. So these are all that new talks on uh, identity. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh... 
so are, is there anyone, so are people satisfied with these as sort of the topic areas or does anyone else have a topic area and identity that they'd like to form a topic table about? Sorry, I didn't hear this explicitly spelled out. There's a, a bit of work going on in uh, the Verifiable Claims Task Force um, at uh, W3C. I'm sorry, on it. Um, around verifiable claims. So uh, the question is, how are we supposed to express statements around identity? Um, and there's specific work happening uh, right now to try and start a, a standards track thing. Right? It's very experimental, uh, free standards, but uh, I think we should probably be at the table. So one thing that I didn't hear was how, how efficiently can we verify identities using the blockchain. So it's actually very easy to lie without poking the blockchain. We're just putting two identities in the chain and then showing the Merkle proof. But it turns out you know, that's not a non-membership proof. So I would like to see some discussion about efficient identities using the blockchain. So think clients. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure if it's separate or not. I just seem like a slightly different use case from say the medical one is we're interested in identity from the point of view of education and educational recognition. So I don't know if anyone else is interested in talking about that. Thank you. I think uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about the large scale experimental project going on in India about a universal identity where you know the iris scan of people is taken and you get, get a card with your QR code with your identity on it. My key challenge from a people perspective is the acquisition and creating of that identity. Specifically, these people are going into remote places, having small kids, and providing identity to illiterate people who can't even read and write and still should be or having the capability of opening an account. And how do we get out there? How do we ensure that we can propagate the identity process, not just in developed countries or countries having access to all kinds of, uh, you know, themes with which this can be created, but how do we take it across to 7 billion people, or maybe 5 billion of those who do not have this kind of an access? My name is Jay, and uh, we're working on uh, Tendermint, which is a blockchain consensus engine. It's uh, mostly known in private blockchain space, but we would argue that it can also work in the public space with a proof of stake overlay. But anyways, the point is that using classical Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, using cryptographic public keys as identity for securing the chain, you can get much better uh, white client proofs. So if anybody wants to talk about better proof systems like we were talking about in the intro. Okay, uh, anyone else on identity? Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Joshua from BT. Uh, we spoke about identity and the, the fact is IoT management systems has identification, authentication, and that is uh, authorization. Something we've been looking at is, is for example, to put identity in context, um, that the verification is good if you have, say, biometrics in your place, form, and IoT management systems do that quite well. Uh, so we've been exploring how to do authorization as an interoperability layer between IoT management systems and security company systems. Uh, so I'd like to discuss. So what we're doing, if, so listen to these topics. If any of these interest you more than the, uh, we're going to have a topic table for each one of the topics that comes up. If any of them interests you, just keep in mind which one you want to go to. Yeah, I'll also ask people who just stood up and talked about things that they would like to talk about to start moving towards the front so that we'll see them and we'll just start like forming groups or whatever. Uh, it'll be easier that way. Um, I. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, yeah. Uh, and we'll try probably merging some of uh, the topics together. Uh, I will throw in one thing, which is 
what is the minimum set of things uh, that belongs to identity uh, on the blockchain? I just want to clarify if, if I was to do a table or if we participate in the table, the subject that I, I really like to talk about is taking all these things off chain, like all these, these things that you see that want to put on chain, how do you do it with identity and that specific? So um, I lead the Hyperledger Identity Working Group, and in about 15 minutes, uh, there's a conference call where IBM is going to be presenting about membership services. So if you are interested in Hyperledger or IBM's membership services, we have a separate room for people who might want to come in there and capture and their thoughts uh, around um, uh, Hyperledger's identity uh, system. Uh, purely optional, and we have a room for it outside. I'm sorry. Okay, so Hyperledger um, has one proposal, which is IBM's Fabric. IBM's Fabric has a unique identity architecture with some of its own cryptographic primitives that IBM has not been really clear about the architecture, about how it works. Today is the day that they're announcing how it works and you know, all of that. So if you're interested, if, you know, if you've got a deep commitment to the Hyperledger project, you may want to come in and join this uh, thing. And it'll end at the same time as these uh, breakouts do. Follow me. If you're, if you're interested in following, if you're interested in any of these topics, go to the person that you're interested in. OK. so. Now, people who want to do a table discussion and have something to talk about or had an idea, please move towards the front of the room. So every, all the people who gave lightning talks or stood up and uh, held the microphone for 30 seconds, please move towards the front of the room. Uh, now, I will pass the mic and please summarize in five words or less uh, what, <laughs> well, okay, two sentences, what you wanted to talk about and uh, if you think that you can merge with someone who was talking before or after you, please merge so that we can actually have working groups and not uh, three people at the table. Yes, good idea, thank you. Well, as a simple topic uh, to say, which is, you know, how do we get this identity across to more people in the world? Uh, we have a uh, proof of concept now uh, for the patients and physicians to use. It doesn't have a blockchain component in it, and uh, this pilot uh, that I was talking about is to add the blockchain component and turn this into a legal pilot. So uh, I guess medical application, uh, blockchain on medical application. Uh, amazing like client uh, Merkle proofs or proofs in general for uh, identity. Clarifying identity. 